Welcome to this episode of Business Battle Bar. Recently, Facebook and Ryerson University were kind enough or crazy enough to ask me to come speak at a shindig, which I could not attend due to a scheduling conflict, but I thought the topic was fascinating and I said, oh, if only I had a mechanism, a forum, a venue that I could address this. And I said, oh my God, here we are. Context TV, business battleground. They use the term, catch me if you can, which I find a bit arrogant and cocky. So it's their suggestion. I will rephrase it in the more humble, modest, Canadian diplomatic, how to stay ahead of the competition, which is basically the same thing. So there's actually, by coincidence, I swear, 10 points that I want to touch on that will kind of take you through the evolution of what's happened in the online video landscape, going back till about 2005, which is when I had the crazy idea for Watch Mojo. Fast forward to where we are today. So this kind of marries the macro with the micro, uh, the industry with my experience as a Watch Mojo, and then kind of giving you guys uh, some pointers to position yourselves personally, professionally, whether you're an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, an executive, in terms of what you should be looking out for. So, and these are admittedly themes I've covered throughout lots of different episodes on this channel, some of them in the Context is King episodes I do with Rebecca, some of them in standalone business battlegrounds. But the guys at Ryerson and Facebook thought it would be cool to put in one presentation, and I thought, let's just do one video, bring it all together. So admittedly, the first point was, in 2005, um, there was, there was nothing online in terms of video. AOL had just done Live 8 and it was kind of cool showing that, oh wow, you could actually stream video online. And you had the portals that had kind of like started to dabble with adding video to the text and images that they were serving alongside horoscopes and many other things. But by and large, it was kind of like the wild, wild west and there was really not a robust enough economic framework to entice HBO or ABC to put their content online. So as I was kind of like thinking about what to do with my life um, after leaving my employer, um, uh, you know, and having a, a little bit of money to possibly invest in, in something, I, I realized that you had this opportunity where you had a vacuum in the middle of this content pyramid, which we'll put up on the screen, where at the top, you had super premium content. I'm sure you've seen this pyramid before. And at the bottom, you have user generated content that was changing radically, publishing and news gathering and all that. But in the middle, you had this opportunity to kind of come up with content that audiences historically were interested in, but in a format that made sense for, you know, a delivery on a computer or soon your mobile. And we kind of said, let's just produce a bit of everything. And admittedly, the second point that I realized was that videos were going to at first not necessarily catch fire because audiences online just had no experience with watching videos online. The reality is the bandwidth was in there, broadband was in there, hosting made it expensive, and the first wave of content producers like Sudo and Pop.com who tried to do that before the dot-com bubble burst basically failed. And even the second wave of content producers like Mania and, and Heavy well, they had to build websites and build the content and build the distribution and build the monetization. So it was just too many things to do at once. So it kind of dawned on me that if you were to create like a fashion video and put it next to a, a gallery of fashion tips or fashion looks, could you tell I'm a fashion connoisseur? Or if you were to kind of take a video on Madrid and put it next to an article of Madrid and, and so on, if you had a cooking recipe that would go next to a cooking recipe, then maybe that could find a contextual um, kind of environment where somebody would then become conditioned slowly but surely to watch instead of just read. And frankly, from an economic perspective, it would give me the opportunity to get licensing dollars from USA Today to access our catalog or from glam.com, which went out of business, or iGen, which is still very much in business, that we could basically supply our videos alongside their articles, and that worked. Um, the portals were our clients in terms of licensing, as was Hulu. The third opportunity was when I realized, okay, we can't be everything to everyone, which was both a personal conclusion I reached on my journey as an entrepreneur, but also just like as an analyst, I kind of woke up. So I woke up one day, literally, and I realized nobody's waking up to go check out Watch Mojo. And I was like, I wonder what we're publishing today. I said, you know what? 
Somebody could very well stumble on our website if they're searching for a fondue recipe and we have a fondue video. And if somebody goes to Yahoo and it's Martin Luther King Day and we have a biography of, of the great civil rights leader, then maybe they will see that video. But nobody actually in their right mind is waking up in 2006 or seven saying, ooh, ooh, what is Watch Mojo is gonna publish today? Non-existent. That person did not exist and I knew it. But I also had been tired of being rejected by investors and everybody that was like, you're just doing way too much. Pick something, pick a vertical. One guy offered me, uh, Bo Peabody, who was the founder of, I wanna say Tripod in the dot-com era. He offered me a couple hundred grand if, uh, if we would pivot to become a beauty and style producer. And I was like, I know why you say that looking at me, but that's not what I'm passionate about. But it kind of dawned on me that we should focus. And as I've alluded to many times, sitting in Madison Square Park, saying, that's it, I'm gonna go to war with the army I have, not with the army I want, and we're good at ranking and comparing and doing lists and talking about, is this better than that? And you know what? That's what we're gonna do because nobody's doing that at the time, that was true. So we kind of focused very much instead of lifestyle and knowledge and entertainment on entertainment. And the reason was, especially when it came to lifestyle, let's take makeup tips, I was in New York during ad week and Tim Armstrong, chairman of AOL, comes on stage and he's like, I'm gonna get my friend to come talk to us about these wonderful uh, makeup videos we're gonna be doing with a sponsor, Heidi. Heidi Klum comes out. I remember being in the audience and emailing the office going, are we doing, is Heidi Klum in our videos? They're like, Ash, stop drinking. And so, no, Heidi Klum was not in our videos. And then at the bottom of the spectrum, from super premium Heidi Klum videos, we had user generated content where a relative unknown Michelle Phan would be doing makeup videos and then she would go on to become this builder of an empire because she was far more passionate at makeup videos than we could have ever been. And I recognized that wisely and I picked a, a boxing ring that I felt we could win and that was top 10 lists on pop culture, entertainment, around fair use clips because we had relationships and I was crazy enough to take that risk. But that was basically number four, why we chose entertainment because it dawned on me that again, if you're looking for a makeup video or you're looking for a recipe or you're looking to find out if you should go to Madrid or Barcelona when you have an extra day in Spain, that's pretty in and out. You're not that passionate about it. It's very utilitarian. I believe the term is service journalism. But if you are a fan of Star Wars or Star Trek or Game of Thrones or Jimi Hendrix or, you know, Family Ties, you're going to basically read up and watch so much content and you're going to consume it. And watch time before was a thing with the algorithm is something we kind of realized that was going to be popular because it was no longer about unique users and page views and impressions. You could tell that marketers ultimately were going to say, well, you know what, you could get a user in and out and it's a bot, B-O-T. Uh, traffic, whereas spending time consuming content was going to win, and that is all about entertainment and infotainment and things you're passionate about. And growing up reading encyclopedias and magazines, that's where I had a font of information and I knew more useless facts I thought were useless. Obviously, they turned out to be very useful, and that was another good decision we made to stay ahead of the competition that was kind of starting to do what we were doing. The fifth point is the long tail versus YouTube. I mentioned that we used to license our videos to a plethora of publishers, but oftentimes it would be an intermediary who would take our content, put it in their little black box and push it out. And oftentimes to sites that kind of didn't really exist, it was BOT bot kind of traffic. Some of them were great, great websites. Sometimes our content would end up on fantastic websites and it was a little kind of a moral victory for us. But I realized that this long tail of internet traffic was not really all that it was basically propped up to be. And as a user myself, I would be kind of working, answering emails, sending proposals, listening to music. And for me, I would listen to music on YouTube and I would say, my Lord, there's a lot of activity here. These are comments and there's real engagement. People seem to be sharing this content. So I said, you know what? We were very early on YouTube and as I've shared with you previously, we'd send emails to YouTube on day one where, you know, Steve Chen would reply to me and, and we kind of compare 
you know, strategies for how we would be trying to build our respective businesses. And of course, he now owns many islands and here we are still in the trenches trying to make sense of all this. But the point was, it was clear that YouTube was going to win. And so the fifth decision was to bet the farm on YouTube, which was great. Now, once we decided to bet the farm on YouTube number six, we had to decide what are we going to do? And at that era, 2011, 2012, it was clear absolutely clear that YouTube did not need two things. It did not need another multi-channel network and it did not need another vlogger. Now, ironically, we kind of dipped our toes in both. We had a lot of other content producers, let's say a car review producer, who'd come to us and say, ooh, I see you guys are covering in our horizontal era. You're doing car clips as well as fashion and entertainment and travel. Do you want our car clips? And I kind of felt that we couldn't be both serving our content product producer friends and our own needs. So we kind of said, yeah, I don't really know how this Watch Mojo Presents initiative is gonna pan out. And even though the very first clips we did were very much vlogger-esque, I also recognized that ultimately these talking head videos would not necessarily stand out because everybody was looking at the camera, ironically, as I'm doing now, and giving their two cents. And history is, of course, very much cyclical and there's a regression to the mean. And so we decided at the time to double down on this clip format because we felt like that would stick out. And in fact, at that moment, Travel Channel, VH1, if you go back to that content pyramid, we're not online and we purposely wanted to stand out of the clutter and project this aura of quality and professionalism by making our content look like the next generation of cable programming or network programming. And it worked. Once we started to build on YouTube and see more and more people get on the platform and recognize that finally record labels were willing to kind of usher an era of detente with YouTube, that's around the time Vivo came around, we knew that, hey, if this Beyonce video is getting hundreds of millions of views, well, that video is no longer gonna be taken down by its label. What we should be doing obviously because we're passionate about it, but also because we recognize an opportunity, is to produce this shoulder content, whether it's a biography of Beyonce or a top 10 or a Beyonce versus Whitney Houston or versus Madonna clip, to basically sit alongside this music video of Beyonce because that will appear in the related videos. So when people ask about our success on YouTube, there's a lot of things that we did that were common sense that then afterwards were kind of galvanized in the Hammurabi code of YouTube that became kind of the best practices. We were producing videos that were always a little bit longer than the industry norm. And because people would sit through our videos because it was good quality, then we drove a lot of watch time. And similarly today, a lot of video discovery comes from the related videos alongside the video you are watching. And because we're producing a lot of music videos, uh, related videos, biographies, and top tens, then we were getting a lot of mileage early on. And as much as I, without a doubt, confirm hats off, shout out, and props to the influencers and the YouTubers, who I think are the soul of the platform, I still think to this day that really what drove the mass popularity of YouTube was music and gaming. And anybody that says otherwise is kind of not being realistic because Sure, when it's brandcast or when it's YouTube summits, you'll oftentimes see the influencers be propped up, pushed out on stage to talk about how wonderful YouTube is. But let's be honest, that's because SpongeBob, a property of Viacom, was not gonna get on stage and sing YouTube's praises when YouTube was being sued by Viacom. And if you're Taylor Swift saying how these platforms are not paying enough to musical artists, well then guess what? You neither will get up there and talk about how wonderful YouTube is ergo why the influencers have become the kind of face of YouTube, but they are the soul, which I think is the key. A lot of people then say, well, why the listicles? Why did you decide to do these lists? Today, everybody does lists. Everybody comes to me. And I think some of that is sure, our success has drawn a lot of others to emulate that. But I tell people it's not like we invented lists, right? Wayne's World, Letterman, Moses, the OG of top 10 lists with the 10 commandments. I think I recognized early on that you would see this kind of explosion of content creation, not just of text, which had already started, um, but also of videos. I mean, did I know specifically that the iPhone would come around and that, you know, there would be this awesome cloud-based editing tools that you could use, or even your phone could be more powerful than 
you know, we were talking to our friends over at the CBC, which is kind of like Canada's BBC, and they were like, yeah, our new office is gonna be smaller in square footage, but we'll be able to pack in more people because guess what? You don't need all this big, heavy equipment and, and editing consoles, and times have changed. But we could see, number eight, that guess what? Um, lists would be perfect for the short attention era, and we were right. And the reason why, number nine, we decided to embrace clips and fair use wasn't because we were necessarily maniacal and masochist, although that comes into it, it's just because nobody else was gonna go down that path. At the time, being in the third wave of content producers, we did have you know, other competitors like Revision 3 and Next New Networks that were fundamentally trying to do the same thing. They were trying to adapt storytelling for this new generation that was kind of growing up alongside YouTube. But what they were doing ultimately is using their venture capital funding to poach the talent from one another. And since I didn't have the millions of dollars that they did, I knew I wasn't really gonna be able to compete for talent the way that they were. And since they had venture capitalists who, despite their bravado, are actually quite risk averse, I knew that they would not embrace clips the way we did. If you fast forward to today, a lot of venture back firms like Group 9 Thrillist, and now this, totally have embraced fair use, though I guarantee you when I would meet their founders and compare notes with their executives, they would be shocked at the fact that we embraced copyright exemptions around fair use, but today it's fair game. And even a, a brand like Business Insider that is owned by a German company, Axel Springer, in which fair use does not exist the way it exists here, they totally embrace it. So today, kind of commonplace, but when we did it, it was definitely going against the grain and uh, innovative. And that's great. Uh, and then lastly, I would say today, this all brings us to where we are today. When I was at the summit of uh, Facebook and Snap in, uh, I believe I was November of 2019, I kind of sat back and to be very candid with you, as an entrepreneur who definitely recognized the web video revolution, I had kind of bittersweet thoughts. On the one hand, competition is good. Competition, to paraphrase uh, Michael Douglas, greed is good. Competition is cuts through the bullshit. Competition allows me a president, CEO, owner, founder, shareholder, entrepreneur, whatever, a driven mofo, to kind of come in and say, guys, this is great. We're blessed, we're fortunate. It's not enough. Effort alone isn't gonna get us to where we need to be. It's gotten us here, it won't get us there. And we need to hustle more, we need to finish the plays, we need to play 60 minutes. And we gotta hustle on every play. Not hustle like Gary V hustle, although there's nothing wrong with Gary V, but I'm saying just finish your plays, be concentrated, don't dial it in, don't take anything for granted. So competition is good. But as I sat there, it did kind of hit me, again, as it's hit me every day for the last five years, that we're no longer the only ones who figure this out. Everybody is doing this, large or small, new media or old. Recently, Bloomberg's TikTok, which unfortunately for them was named exactly like the Chinese popular social media platform, rebranded to quick take i think and there's there were like 60 video producers are going to be working on tiktok quick take i was like 60 that's more employees than we have right and that's good it's all good but the point i want to make is that a real true entrepreneur doesn't take that for granted and doesn't view that as a bad thing we've consistently now for 15 years kept our feet moving and as we went from five employees to 10 to 25 to 50 to 75, including freelancers, probably 150, and now we're at about 50 employees, and again, including freelancers over 100, I kind of realize and appreciate that the big opportunity here is that agility to adapt. And the 2020s, if the question is how do you stay ahead of the competition, is you learn from the competition. You get a high off of competition. You pick up a few things to do. You certainly pick up a few things not to do. But the 2020s are all about this blurring that we've been talking about. Like, ooh, the $75 billion ad market is going to flow from TV to the internet. And that's not really happened. And with things like, you know, over the top OTT connected devices, you're almost seeing a lot of like the NBCs and the Viacoms kind of just swapping the dollars that they got from TV shifting themselves to um, mobile and computer access um, and entertainment and information, 
What you've basically seen is the rise of the internet ad dollars coming just basically at the expense of print and maybe to some extent radio. But as that breaks the dam, that $75 billion eventually somehow gets online, what I think you are going to see is the value of a user, whether you are watching on this, on this, or on this, well actually this is still just a big screen, but imagine this was a, it's all the same, that's actually symbolically the point. There is going to be this convergence of the value to a marketer, whether you're watching content on any screen. And content, I think as a programmer, as a curator, as a licensor, you almost have a responsibility to the user to give them the best experience wherever they want to watch the content. And marketers have always followed the audiences. And I think if you are a younger version of Ash with Fabio-like hair before venturing into the entrepreneur racket, you have to recognize that that is probably an even bigger opportunity that I faced. Being able to produce content for either Disney Plus, and I assure you the same way Hulu on day one said, Ash, we don't need your content, but before launch in 2007, they're like, eh, could you call us back? We're gonna need a bit more content. The opportunity to feed the appetite of both Disney Plus and TikTok, both YouTube and Netflix, both HBO Max and Peacock, and Snap and Instagram, as these distribution delivery mechanisms blur, as these screens blur, and as the value of a viewer watching this becomes more or less equal across the board. That chaos, that confusion, if you as an entrepreneur and an executive can figure out how to capitalize on that, then in a decade you'll be sitting on this chair.